Hey, up oh, right, we've been uh, plagued with weather and technical issues in the production of this video. I've done the best I can. The weather's been atrocious with uh, local flooding on the roads, etc. So I've had to pick and choose when I can actually get out to film the sort of riding sequences. Then I had some problems with my action camera that decided to just start sort of uh, filming five minute segments despite being set to constant filming. So it kept missing bits out and I had to go back and do it again. And then on top of that, um, this well-known fault with the speedo on the very early Classic 350 Reborns, of which mine is one, decided to rear its ugly head in the uh, first attempt at filming, which um, caused some issues because I didn't know how fast I was going, so I couldn't really gauge what was going on with this latest modification, which is... A stage 2 upgrade using the DNA performance filter. Now I've managed to sort of reset the um, speedo and get it working again although, though from what I can gather uh, this is usually only a temporary fix. So I'll let you know how I get on with the warranty process because apart from a scratched side panel on the Classic 500 which was sorted out no problem sort of three four years ago this would be the first time that I've ever had to make a warranty claim on a Royal Enfield motorcycle. Right, first of all, with any motorcycle modification, if you're wanting to just sort of noticeably tweak the performance of the bike, the air filter is the first place to look. Manufacturers' air filters are very restrictive, and they're very restrictive for several reasons, really. One is cost. They want the cheapest air filters they can possibly get their hands on that will do the job adequately, obviously to ward off any expensive warranty claims to, uh, you know, regarding engine damage through particulates getting into the engine. And of course, the advantage of using these heavy-duty paper filters is that they are a consumable item, so you know, a few miles down the road uh, when it comes into the relevant service, they get to sell you a new air filter. Now, the other reason that they use particularly restrictive air filters is for reasons of noise pollution. Sorry, I was just uh, wiping the lens on the camera then. There was a very fine rain. I wasn't sure whether it'd be affecting image quality or not, so I just periodically wiped it while I was riding, just to make sure. Yeah, so noise pollution, you know, all around the world, different countries have different legislations about how much noise a motor vehicle is allowed to produce. And believe it or not, induction noise is one of the biggest culprits when it comes to, um, you know, going over the allowed regulations for noise pollution. So putting a very restrictive air filter on any motor vehicle makes it easy for any motor vehicle manufacturer to get the noise levels of the vehicle down. But all of this comes at a cost. You know, it's like trying to breathe with someone holding the hand over your mouth. You know, you can perhaps just get enough air in to keep yourself alive, but you wouldn't be able to run a marathon in that situation because you simply wouldn't be able to get enough air for your body to be able to perform. And with these restrictive air filters, that is what the bike is dealing with all the time. It's using a lot of the horsepower that that, that engine is producing to simply suck air into it so that it can breathe. And that's where performance air filters come in. Now, I've been fitting them to probably just about every bike that I've ever had um, since... The 1980s, I used to use KNN filters. I swapped over to DNA about eight years ago because I do believe they're a, a better built filter. Although they both work on very similar principles, I feel that the DNA are a better quality for the money. Now, I just want to deal with something that I know will come up in the comments section. Uh, people worry about engine damage due to using a performance filter. I've been using performance filters for over 40 years. I've never had a motorcycle with engine damage due to uh, using a performance filter. But at the end of the day, the choice is yours. If you don't want to use one, don't use it. If you do, this video's for you. I'm not trying to persuade people either way, you know, uh, to sell a filter. I'm not getting anything for making this video. I'm just making this video because people have an interest in this sort of subject.
Another thing that I would like to make clear is that you cannot improve the top speed of these motorcycles. The top speed is governed by the ECU on these bikes and it monitors the speed via the ABS sensor at the front wheel. There is no way to overriding that. So it doesn't matter what performance modifications you make to these bikes, when you hit 74-75 miles an hour, the ECU will automatically sort of stop you from going any faster. There's no way around that. Well, there might be, but no one's come up with a uh, you know, saleable solution as yet. What you can do, however, with these modifications is improve mid-range performance, which in my book is far more useful than improving top-end speed anyway. And I have to say, of all the motorcycles I've given this treatment to, this Classic 350 has responded far better than any other motorcycle I've tried it on. Now, the initial cost of these filter kits might seem high compared to an OEM filter, but what you've got to remember is that whereas an OEM filter has to be periodically disposed of and replaced, these filters are much like the OEM sponge filters that you used to have on bikes back in the 1970s and the 1980s, where periodically they should be cleaned and re-oiled. And in that respect, they will pretty much last the lifetime of the motorcycle. So if you're the kind of motorcyclist that does big miles, in the long run, this will probably work out cheaper. Now, this Stage 2 kit, I believe, is identical for the Meteor 350 and the Classic 350, but it's slightly different for the Hunter, so make sure you get the right kit for your bike. I'll leave links in the video description now below. Now, you'll find an open intake plate, and this replaces the one that you'll find fitted to the bike. This is just as important for uh, performance magic, if you like, as the actual filter itself. And I'll show you why in a moment. And obviously, in the kit, you will also find your DNA performance filter. These are actually a, a marvel in mechanics. It's not just a matter of it's got bigger holes in it, so it lets more air through, which in turn lets more particulates through. The design is actually a bit more cunning than that. Rather than having a paper filter with perforations in it, very small perforations, this is a sort of an open mesh with fibres that are allowed to float free. Now, when I say float free, obviously they're securely attached to the filter, otherwise they just go straight into the engine. These filters are actually like lots of little microscopic arms that are constantly flapping about and reacting with the induction and exhaust pulses of the engine. Each of those fibres or arms, whichever you want to refer to them as, are covered in a very sticky filter oil. So as they pulse backwards and forwards, they catch all the particulate matter and trap them in that oil, not allowing any to go into the engine. But at the same time, the special structure allows more airflow to go through it. So you get the same performance as a standard paper filter in respect of capturing particulates, but you get a much higher through rate of airflow. In this case, as near as damn it, twice the amount of air can get through. This takes a huge burden off the engine as you're accelerating. It allows it to spin up faster, resulting in more horsepower to the back wheel earlier on in the rev range. Now, on the Classic 350 and presumably on the Meteor 350, you'll find the air filter housing behind the left-hand side cover. Remove the document panel. You can replace that later on if you want to, or you can leave it out. That's entirely up to you. I put mine back on. But behind it, you'll find the actual air filter chamber with the snorkel cover on it. And as you can see, it has a very limited surface area for allowing air through into the filter. And this is just as restrictive as the actual air filter itself. It's held in place with just three uh, Posidrive or Phillips screws. I'm not sure which they are. I just used my King Dick 3-in-1, which will deal with anything. And once you've removed those, you can just lift the cover off. Now, you won't be reusing this. You'll be using that uh, Stage 2 plate, or bell mouth as they used to be called. 
Now in this case, the paper air filter was actually stuck to the filter plate. It may or may not be in your case. But either way, obviously, you need to remove the filter as well. You then replace it with the DNA filter, remembering to make sure that the open end of the filter faces out, as you see here. You then align the holes on your DNA Stage 2 filter cover and replace the screws. That's pretty much all there is to it. Now, the air is actually drawn into the filter box from underneath the bike. It's not drawn through the document cover or the side panel cover. It's drawn up through an opening beneath the box. So, whether you refit the document cover or, you know, leave it out, it's not going to make any difference to the performance gains that this filter Stage 2 system will give you. Now, I'm always getting questions about whether uh, Royal Enfield engines need to be remapped when you make any sort of intake or exhaust modification. So, we'll just cover that off briefly, and then we'll uh, find out what difference it actually made to this bike. Now, due to EU regulations which tend to affect the rest of the world, since 2015 all bikes have to be fitted with a learning ECU, i.e. the ECU must be able to make suitable adjustments via the O2 sensors, not just to be able to cater with atmospheric differences, but also any modifications that need to be made to the bike. Obviously, you know, an old bike with a rotted out exhaust in 10 years time you might not be able to get a royal enfield exhaust you may have to fit a pattern part and this legislation was put in place in 2015 to ensure that you know machines would operate optimally uh, in the event of that happening in the future and to that end the ecu in these bikes is highly adaptable there's no need to remap them but it is good practice after making a modification like this or fitting a new exhaust or whatever to start the engine up and just allow it to idle for a few minutes. Now, technology-wise, ECUs are far better than they were sort of eight years ago. So, in the case of the 350 here, it can make these adjustments very quickly. But it helps the bike along just to allow it to idle for, say, five minutes so that it can take some samples through what's happening in the exhaust system and make the necessary adjustments to pull everything back into optimal parameters. I don't want to get into any protracted discussions over this in the comments section. If you don't want to do it, don't do it. If you want to do the best you possibly can for your bike, you know, it's five minutes of your time. The choice is yours. But in real world, what difference does this you know, filter stage two system make to the bike? Well, actually, it's very noticeable. The first thing I noticed when I was pulling off my drive, which is a gravel drive, using my normal sort of throttle technique to set off, it immediately set the back wheel spinning. There was noticeably a lot more power there at the low end as I was setting off. So for normal riding, you are going to have to adjust your throttle technique a little bit, just turn it down a little bit. Now, it's a shame that I encountered that issue with the speedo sort of, you know, within a few miles of sort of carrying out this modification because it's the first impressions that make all the difference. Because I had to go back and refilm it all, I'd sort of got used to the differences, which made it harder to discern when I was filming for this segment of the video. Throttle response is much sharper low down in the rev range. It won't turn your 350 into a super bike, but you will definitely notice the difference. Then there's the induction roar. It turns the bike from an asthmatic kitten into a healthy tiger cub. It's a glorious sound, just how a bike should sound in my book. From a standstill up to 30 miles an hour, there's a lot more acceleration there going through the gears. Top gear handles acceleration from 30 miles an hour up to 40 miles an hour, far better than it did before. With the tendency to lug if you give it too much throttle at 30 miles an hour in top gear, pretty much dialed out as far as I could tell. It handles hills better, 
but then from 40 to 50 miles an hour it seems to return sort of back to its old self it's only when you push it over 50 miles an hour that the effect seems to return again up to 60 after that i suspect it will sort of trail off and re revert back to its old self but obviously i couldn't push it any harder than that on these roads there's quite a lot of subsidence in some areas you're hampered by 40 mile an hour zones now whereas it, this road used to be de-restricted all the way through and there are a lot of sort of blind bends where dog walkers seem to suddenly appear so i, I had to be careful on the whole, from a standstill through mid-range up to about 75% of the bike's top end, it's made a huge improvement to the way the engine behaves. It's much more tractable with more power where you need it most, if you need to overtake, or if you need to get out of a junction a little bit faster than you first anticipated. It develops a lot more power a lot earlier than the bog standard configuration does, and certainly holds it well up to 60 miles an hour. Now, I spoke to Hitchcocks about this, who obviously they have their own dyno and they've tested this bike at various stages of modification and they say that this DNA Stage 2 represents the biggest boost in real-world power of all the enhancements that are available for this bike, which I can well believe. First impressions for me was that it had pumped the low-end power up by about 25%. In reality... I don't think it was anywhere near as much as that. But I remember feeling very surprised at how different the bike felt. It makes a very tangible difference. Now, I'm going to let the video play out in a moment with a sort of two or three minute segment of riding on my favourite little bit of uh, hilly, twisty roads. Hopefully the sound of the engine will come through, although we had some quite bad crosswinds. Do affect microphone pickup. As I said earlier on, I will leave links in the video description down below. My personal opinion, if you don't want to spend too much money, but you do want to make a, a, a real world modification that will make a difference to the usability and pleasure of riding this bike, this is definitely the way to go. Or if you're a tinkerer, that wants to go through a program of modifications this has got to be your first stop once again thank you so much for taking the time to watch this and my other videos i really do appreciate it and i would really appreciate it if you would leave a like and subscribe to the channel if you're not already a subscriber or if you want to support the channel in other ways you can become a patron via the link down below in the video description or you can contribute via the super thanks button, which seems to be the preferred method these days. I will, of course, be back on Friday. I'm not quite sure what's happening the bike with the bike and, you know, the speedo issue at the moment. I was hoping to get a new exhaust fitted to the bike. We'll see how that goes. Either way, of course, I will be back on Friday. So until then, if you're riding, please ride safely, and I'll see you soon.